Good morning. My name is uh, Arlene Hawaiian. I'm the Director for Customer Success and Engagement of Cypher Learning. And I'm here to talk about learning experience design for teacher. teachers. I will talk about, I will share my experience as a teacher. Um, I've taught uh, 12 years of uh, two business students uh, teaching uh, marketing and uh, advertising subjects in, in my previous uh, occupation. And I will share also what I've learned working with different organizations who are implementing online learning. So uh, for today, I'll discuss our challenge as teachers, given the new context of the pandemic, uh, how we should prepare or what are the things that we need to talk about as we prepare to teach online or work towards preparing the students at the start of the classes for the school year. And then what are the things we need to consider, additional things that factor in when we analyze our learners, and then of course, designing the learner experience. So to start, uh, I would like to share my thoughts about uh, when we were in the elementary, might reveal a little bit about my age. Uh, we used to have just one type of sneakers, just the white ones. It may, we may buy different brands, but we didn't have a lot of designs. So the sneakers that we use, same design, uh, same model for whatever athletic thing we were doing, uh, physical education in class, running, badminton, basketball, volleyball, or even going out. So we had the same types of shoes. There was no differentiation. But now we have thousands of models of shoes for any kind of athletic purpose, right? So whether it's for fashion or whether it's for an athletic purpose. So you have different types of shoes. And even in, uh, there are certain websites now, let's say for example, Nike, you can go to their website and customize or design your own personal Nike pair of shoes. So that's how much personalization or customization is possible today. However, when you look at our educational systems or our schools, our classrooms, it's still very much assembly line. There's very little personalization that's happening, even if we try to consider analyzing the learners, right? So we, they still go through the same experiences. They still go through uh, the same processes. And what happens is even if we assess them, we give them a, uh, the same assessment for the purpose of being fair even if they have uh, different characteristics that may or may not be advantageous or disadvantageous to them to be able to perform uh, exams or measurement of the skills and target competencies that they should have earned or achieved while they were in school. So if we want to provide um, the ability to differentiate or personalize uh, learning, we need to, of course, we're very lucky to have the capability to use technology now to provide differentiated instruction. It would have been uh, very, very difficult in the past without internet, without information technology, but now we have that kind of capability. But we need to understand that we go through stages when we integrate technology. So this one is from the, per from the perspective of a learner when somebody, whether by age or familiarity, starts using technology, of course, we start with being a uh, the need for having full direction. So learners are given instructions, step-by-step -step instructions on how to use technology. And then in the next stage, as they become more comfortable with the use of technology or being able to um, have more access, whether devices or connectivity, uh, we are able to leverage that access. Uh, uh, we are able to have better uh, integration with technology, but there's no support supporting frameworks for planning. Next is uh, when, the, when we introduce mobile technology, you know, because of the internet that allowed students to really learn online when school started to do that, it becomes... Uh, a type of disruption now because the classroom becomes flexible. 
So you now have blended learning experiences where people can still learn even if they're not in the traditional classroom. Then finally, you have self-directed learning wherein um, the implementation requires uh, learners to consistently self-direct uh, their uh, core competencies uh, of learning experiences. So what does this mean? Uh, students ha have the ability now to find, uh, navigate themselves no, in terms of their learning with uh, minimal or minimal assistance from their teachers. So from the pe perspective of the teachers, how does, how, do, how does the role of teachers evolve then? Of course, stage one, the teacher is the authority or the coach, no? provides uh, informational lectures, uh, coaching, and then helping overcoming uh, deficiencies and uh, resistance. As the student becomes uh, more co comfortable, uh, the student becomes interested, so the teacher becomes the motivator and the guide. And then as the student becomes more involved, the role of the teacher starts to become a facilitator of uh, group interaction or maybe facilitating the experience for, for the learner. Finally, when the student knows how to frame a problem, ask questions, find uh, sources of information or uh, their own learning uh, resources to come, to come up with the solutions or answers to their questions or be able to build their own skill, the teacher becomes the consultant or the delegator of the learning task. Um, what's important that we need to think about today is when we think, uh, when we design uh, all the learning activities, parents have a critical role as our co-teachers because they need to be able to provide uh, the learning space, the connectivity, the device, or even be able to function as support in the learning activities of the students in the, uh, at home. But how do we do that, right? How do we make sure that we're able to track all of these things? How do we make sure that there's uh, continuity in the learning activities? I think we first we need to think about uh, our preparation as teachers and as for school administrators or even uh, the school itself, right? So uh, I'll share two models to try to explain how we integrate technology. First is SAMAR and then TIPA. Okay, we all know that using technology in school can help students learn. But how could our teachers reflect on how effectively they're using technology? Well, that's what this model is for, the SAMR model. It's kind of like a Bloom's taxonomy for educators. It was created by this guy, Dr. Ruben Puentadora, who believes that using technology allows us to think differently and perform new tasks. After all, if we have today's technology, then why teach like we did 20 years ago? There's four different levels and two different sections in SAMR. Let's take a look at the first level, substitution. This is where the technology used acts as a direct substitute. Let's take the task of persuasive essay writing. I could write an essay by hand, or I could type an essay using the basic features of a word processing program. The task is the same, and there's no functional change. The technology is being used as a substitute. Lots of teachers start out at this level, but don't worry. Because substitution is not a bad thing, even the best teachers visit this level from time to time. The next level is called augmentation. This is where the task is still the same, but the tech allows for some sort of functional improvement. So instead of writing our persuasive essay on paper, we could use a program like Google Docs. With this software, the task is still the same, but the unique features of a collaborative document provide some functional improvement. In both these levels, the technology is used to simply enhance a lesson. This technology may make tasks more efficient, but it's not likely to make a big difference in future outcomes. Most learning takes place above the line. And it starts with modification. Here the technology is used to provide a significant task redesign. So instead of simply writing an essay, a student could publish a WordPress blog using text, embedded videos, pictures, and other web links to convey their argument. The audience is no longer just the teacher either. It's the entire world. People from anywhere with an internet connection could review or comment on their writing, allowing for deeper analysis. The 
final level in the ultimate goal of technology integration is redefinition. Here, the technology allows for the creation of new tasks that were previously inconceivable. Instead of writing that essay, students could now create and publish a digital storytelling project to argue their writing with multimedia. Plus, just like the blog, through publishing this movie to the world, it allows for other people to comment and analyze their message. So the heart of the assignment is still the same, but the technology allows them to engage in a new, more involved task that's otherwise not possible. At these levels, learning is transformed through the use of technology. When we are more engaged and involved, significant improvements in learning are more likely to take place. Different people have different ideas about SAMR. Some think that SAMR is like a ladder that you climb. You start a substitution and work your way up to redefinition. Others think each level is like a swimming pool that you swim in or visit from time to time throughout the school year, and that's okay. Because no matter the interpretation, the real power of the framework is that it promotes reflective teaching in the classroom. What you do, why you do it, and how it helps learning. By thinking about the different levels, teachers can focus on designing digital learning experiences that will help improve student outcomes. See, the thing about SAMR is this. It's not the type of tech tool that defines the level. It's how the individual teacher uses it in their lesson. So whether you're substituting or redefining learning, remember the ultimate outcome for integrating technology should be simple. Maximizing, maximizing student, student success. success. Want more information on SAMR? Check out these links. That was a very interesting uh, video done by a student to show understanding of uh, the SAMR model. But uh, I think what's important about understanding this model of technology integration is uh, the analogy of climbing a ladder or swimming. So many of us are still at the early steps of a ladder or maybe the shallow end of um, the pool. So we also need to think about our learning of uh, tools or learning how to teach uh, using technology in that manner. So for school leaders out there, for our subject heads, uh, or even uh, our, our administrators, uh, I hope that we also consider the SAMR when we train teachers so that they will not feel overwhelmed. And it's also a way to at least scaffold their capabilities. Uh, it's also a, a, a perspective for us to understand the teaching practice from, from uh, an executable model like the SAMR. But the next uh, video explains the TPAC model, which identifies the kinds of knowledge, additional knowledge that we need to learn in being able to teach online. Okay, we all know that using technology in school can help. Here's TPAC in two minutes. For more information, visit tpac.org. So first we have to ask, what is it? Well, TPAC is a framework that combines three knowledge areas, our technological knowledge, content knowledge, and our pedagogical knowledge. And it looks at how they work together to increase student motivation and to make the content more accessible to students. We look at the content as the what. It's the subject matter we're teaching, like ecology, music, algebra, health, geometry, or art history, to name a few. Then we look at our pedagogical knowledge. It's the how. Every teacher has tools, so let's put them to use. Are we going to be using direct instruction? Will this be inquiry-based, group discussions? How are we going to make the content more accessible by the way we present it to our students? Then we look at selecting the appropriate technology because it's the partner. What tool will we select to make the content more accessible to the students while supporting the pedagogical strategy which we've identified will help to deliver this information to students. 
we must identify those support features to really help us use technology to reach our outcome. As we understand them individually, we can start to see overlaps. Our TP knowledge allows us to understand how we're making the content more accessible. Our TC knowledge allows us to identify the affordances of pairing the appropriate technology to the content. And our PC knowledge allows us to identify the affordances of pairing the appropriate pedagogical strategies with the content. TPAC comes from the overlapping in that center spot, or as we refer to it as the sweet spot, when all three knowledge areas work together. It's crucial to remember that surrounding this is the context that's you and your students. This may look differently when you walk into classrooms because at the heart of TPAC is meeting students' needs. Okay, so that is uh, TPAC. So there are different types of some. This is uh, probably the reason why Here's we TPAC feel two overwhelmed. Minutes. For more information, we feel visit. overwhelmed with uh, everything that we need to learn at a very short span of time. So it's possible that we can look at uh, combine TPAC and some are when we. Uh, design training activities for teachers as well. So to be able to do that, you know, design having that framework, we carry these models and then begin to think like designers. You know? um, what does this mean for us to think like designers? For those who are married or who have attended a wedding or who were ever involved in planning somebody's wedding, it's I think a good analogy for understanding uh, learning experience design, right? Because um, when we think of weddings, we want like for the bride, he, she wants the wedding to be something that not only she will remember for the rest of her life, but it's also something that has meaning to everyone that's important to her, the groom, and of course their families, their friends. She wants this momentous occasion is something that will forever be memorable. So they plan every little detail in the wedding from the rings to the cake, the souvenirs, the food, the motif, because everything has meaning. And it's a reflection of um, what's important to, to them uh, when people get married. So when we think about uh, designing learning experiences, we think about each element of the activities, what people will go through, the flow, because uh, we know that each uh, tool, element, content, whatever we use will be, uh, will help or an integration of all um, elements that will make for one memorable experience. No? So learning experience design, we're actually combining user experience. User experience before for, for our perspective is what are the things uh, that students experience in the classroom, in computer laboratories, or inside the campus. Of course, we have to consider now uh, all the digital tools that they will be using, whether it's those are devices or uh, sites, websites, web resources that we will be providing uh, for them, and marry that with instructional design or our pedagogical approaches, our teaching strategies. So when you combine the two, it becomes learning learner experience design. So learner experience design is uh, the process of creating learning experiences that enable the learner to achieve the desired learning outcome in a human-centered and goal-oriented way. So when we talk about human-centered, it recognizes that there are differences in each learner and it's goal-oriented because it's focused not just on the numerical score, but also the achievement of uh, learning outcomes or learning competencies. What are the salient features of the LXD or learning experience design? It's a holistic and interdisciplinary approach. So we're thinking about, uh, when you say holistic, you're not just thinking about the elements. No? You're looking at the learner and uh, the entirety of the development of the learner. And it's an interdisciplinary approach because we look at different aspects, the emotional, uh, physical aspect, the mental, or even how some, uh, a particular subject matter can connect to other subjects or courses or topics or even competencies. No? For example, the, when, when we're teaching math, it's still possible to 
target uh, critical thinking or communication, creativity as competencies, which also complement uh, how other subjects target the achievement of these competencies. So LXD should make learning enjoyable, engaging, relevant, and informative. And since the key word here is experiential, we think about the experience by taking into account the realities, no? including the environment where the students are learning. So this is particularly important today because they will not just be learning in the classroom or in the campus, they, they will be learning at home or even everywhere. So much of the uh, learning experience design uh, stems from the design thinking process. When we think about the design thinking process for course development, we have uh, five major steps here. So the first most important part is the ability to empathize, no? to practice empathy. So when we analyze the learner, we don't just think about prior knowledge, the tools that they have, but we try to put ourselves in their shoes, you know, think about uh, what their pain points are, I'll share a tool later about uh, empathy. And then, of course, we construct a point of view based on their needs. No? We define their needs. And then we ideate by thinking about uh, the course interactions. We try to design, uh, the uh, identify the different personas, and then the course narratives. And then we de develop a representation of the course in the LMS. Uh, that's how we prototype or make uh, a, a uh, the output of our course development. But when you talk about this, no, you put items in the LMS, all the resources that you find to design the learning experience, and then you test it. So you test design from a learner perspective and edit into the ideal final format. So uh, you try to view it from the perspective of the learner. You try to get a co-teacher to test it and then refine because sometimes when we create uh, materials or design materials, it's not as easily viewable as we thought it to be. So we have to be also patient with uh, minute or constant uh, revision, constant improvement of our work. So when we talk about empathy, we try to see the world from their perspective. We try to understand their feelings, appreciate them as human beings, and communicate our understanding. When we say communicate our understanding, uh, we are saying that we recognize the difficulties that you are facing, your constraints. So how is this relevant to us now? So of course, we've seen a lot of uh, complaints from students that don't have um, access to internet. I think that's the challenge that we need to consider being able to empathize, not just to the students, but also the parents. Because one thing we need to realize, even if we have to go online, yeah, number one, not all students will have internet connection or devices at home. That's the one. Number two, even if students have internet connection, it may be limited. So we have to consider whether they're using DSL or data because that has an impact on how much internet access they have. And then, uh, in terms of devices at home, it's, we, don't, we cannot assume that each student will have a device, whether it's a smartphone, a laptop, a desktop, or whatever, or a tablet uh, that's available to them the entire day. It's very likely they, that they will be sharing it with somebody else in the family. Their parents might be, uh, also, on, be also on the uh, computers or using the internet for work, so they will be sharing. So that should factor in uh, also in our experience. And then we think, when we think about our, the parents who will be uh, supporting as co-teachers in the household, especially for the, for the young kids, uh, they, we have to also think about their capability because they will be having so many concerns, doing their jobs, running the household, and even preparing the students for what they need to be able to learn. So that factors in the number of hours, the number of activities, the number of requirements that we design for the students as we consider also their environment. So this is a tool that's uh, empathy map. No? You can use something like this to identify <coughs> uh, similarities. <clears throat> so let's say, for example, 
uh, we try to think about uh, common uh, groups of students, maybe those with internet access, uh, those who are those who do not have devices, and then we try to think about what their uh, different levels of learners, so not just with the device access, but also their capability, uh, sometimes even financially. You know? So what are their feelings? So how is the user feeling about this experience? What really matters to them? So some things like uh, some will be excited because um, they have more flexibility, but some will feel very, very stressed because they, there are so many things to learn for the students, not just using the learning their lessons, but learning how to use technology. This applies also to the parents. They have to learn how to be a co-teacher, learn how to use a device, and learn how to manage uh, their, their, their children in a different setting. So even if there are no parents, it has to be the guardian, the grandparents. So uh, I hope we, we can try to also picture that. No? So what are the pain points? What, what will be the difficulties? And then when we think about what are the tasks that they need to do to accomplish the overall goal? of being able to comply or learn at home, right? And then what are the influences? So for a student, of course, some of the influences will be their parents, their peers, influence on how they act. So these are the things that we, we need to consider. So of course, there's a hotly contested topic that um, should we not do it at all because not everyone will have internet access. But that's still, in. For my, from my perspective, that's because we have, we cannot, uh, it's more of still assembly line thinking. If we look at the approach of differentiated instruction, we should be able to prepare, of course, easily for, for people who have internet connection and devices, we can easily prepare for them much easier, but we can also design uh, differently for those who do not have internet access or for those who have limited inter access, internet access. So we can identify these groups of people and plan together with our school leaders and our administrators or even the community to be able to uh, provide uh, customized learning experiences for these different groups of people. So let me show you one example of um, an empathy map, but this one is from the perspective, I think, of a college student so Mike Black, so uh, there, his goal is uh, gain, is accomplishing goals and learning a new skill in digital media. But uh, the pain is he has a device, pero, uh, but he's stuck indoors. So when he does the homework, so it, his thoughts and feelings, he feels overwhelmed about this. But somehow he has accepted that everything happens for a reason. So what does he see? Only his laptop for the entire day because he is uh, confined to the house but so what does he hear of course opinions of people students peers colleagues in the classroom uh, people reminding him to keep his school so these are some of uh, things that we can uh, based on our, our how we know our students maybe ask their feedback ask the feedback of parents I know some schools have started uh, releasing surveys to as input data for things that we design and that would be very helpful if we can plot it not just with uh, geographic uh, segmentation data or basic, uh, basic um, information but also their thoughts and their feelings. So when we design, um, this is based on Dale's cone of experience, when we design learning activities, no? so when we're just uh, the teacher is talking, you know, uh, it's just really passive learning. But when the students are talking, they're discussing, they're sharing, they're presenting, this is more active learning. And this is, I think, something that students, both students and teachers need to transition into. You know. I remember when we started uh, training teachers on how to do blended learning or even implementing it, uh, you would be surprised that there were students who were complaining that they feel overwhelmed and they feel that when the teacher is not lecturing, the teacher is not teaching if the teacher is just making them do a lot of activities. I think uh, the reason for this is they believe you know, what they have not really understood what active learning is because people or students have been so used to passive learning. And th th I think this is what needs to change. You know? They need to understand that uh, active learning means that they're actively processing the information and not just 
receiving it auditory or just seeing something. But uh, we also need to consider that past, uh, active learning requires much more effort, much more energy. So imagine if you have like eight subjects that require you to do active learning. So we need to also manage the load that students, uh, that, that the students will receive on a weekly basis. So things that we need to consider, of course, a very powerful thing is blended learning. When we come back to the campus, probably late August, we will be doing some form of blended learning because social distancing will, be, will still be required. It's possible. Some uh, schools have already started even uh, way back, no, two years, one year ago, uh, four-day classes. So it's prob possible that students will only be coming to class twice a week or thrice a week and then online for other days. So we need to learn how to blend all of these things. But when you talk about blended learning, it's not just whether you have a classroom activity and online activity. You're also di blending different types of approaches. You're blending the use of different types of media, whether it's Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook, social media, simulations, etc., cetera, uh, mobile phones, uh, whatever devices, and then also different approaches like project-based learning, service learning, inviting somebody who is uh, an expert in an industry. So all of these things as we try to plan the learning experience. So another very important thing that we need to consider is the two modes, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous. A lot of uh, people who were forced to do emergency, uh, emergency teaching, emergency response teaching, uh, or emergency, sorry, emergency remote teaching, most of them st uh, just focus on being able to continue doing uh, lectures or continue synchronous uh, teaching uh, using conferencing tools like Zoom, uh, MS Teams, Hangouts, etc. Right? So they still feel the need to have students be online all at the same time. So communication happens in real time. Students learn at the same time. Uh, however, given the constraints that we have today, this is very, very difficult, not only for the teacher, but also for the students and the parents, right? Because um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's so many factors when students access and they will be sharing devices and connectivity with other members of the family. So what we suggest is we'll, let's have more asynchronous activities where students uh, learn uh, at different times, no, they will have the activities like forums, discussion, discussion forums. They work on their activities. They will still meet online, but they are not required to be online or connect at the same time. So it gives everyone the flexibility to work at their own pace, but still somehow uh, have a, a similar journey towards the the end goal of uh, a course or a lecture or or a lesson. So let's try to design. It doesn't mean that we'll eliminate synchronous activities, but more asynchronous activities and less synchronous activities. So this is uh, where learning management systems or, or online tools come into play because it allows us to monitor all activities, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous. But I'd like to also um, caution you about something that's called the course and a half syndrome. As we learn to blend, Usually, you know, when we try to transition from a regular course to a blended course, a lot of students feel like they're doing more, not just because they're more actively learning than passive, but the, the way the, course, the, the activities are integrated, it's not really properly integrated, so they feel like they're doing more, okay? Because um, there's a sense that what they're doing inside the classroom is totally not really related to what they're doing online, even if it's in a single course. This is why we need to really be able to uh, map the student journey by looking at what's the goal of the student. So this is a sample, uh, a sample illustration, right? Look at their touch points and what their pain points are in each uh, level. So let me show you an example. Um, I did this for one school, but uh, at this, when we were planning the implementation of blended learning in the in their school, we we were identifying one persona, which is the graduate student. So we looked at initially the process of uh, 
the student use learning to use the LMS via uh, to learn via blended learning. So we mapped out the stages, log in, enrolling the course, view lessons, do assignments, and viewing the grades. And then what are their tasks for each? What are their tasks for each stage, right? And then what are the touch points? Like how how do they? Uh, who are the people they need to interact with uh, during this time? And then what are the channels? The offline, who who can they talk to? Online, um, how do they connect to people online? And then. You try to using empathy, right? Empathy mapping. You try to uh, plot their emotional state. So you have their, like, of course, they feel happy if they were able to log in. Uh, they might be curious and excited, or maybe even anxious with this new experience. They might feel overwhelmed, depending or or happy, depending on how the courses are designed. And then part of it, they may feel stressed when they're beating the deadlines. So we try to look at their uh, emotional state. Uh, communication strategies, we identify communication strategies that could help um, uh, in, the, in the, what we think to be their difficulties, right? So identify who will be responsible for each stage and what are the support actions that we need to provide for for those who are responsible and for the learner. So this is one way for somebody, for everyone involved, the teacher, the department, the registrar, to understand the process and everyone's role in each process. So it's possible that when we do something like this, we try to look at uh, the role also of the parents and how they can help support uh, the learning activities in each stage. So this is an example for a student, grade seven student with internet at home. So the, the task is to create a digital presentation. So the learning process stages, you can have motivation. They can start to practice, advanced practice, refinement, and then mastery. So you have these stages, identify the touch points or requirements, their thoughts in each stage, their feelings and pain points, and then try to identify uh, key insights and opportunities. Now, this is for maybe a particular subject or a particular topic in a course or subject. So I'll share uh, three examples of um, how I did blended learning in when I was teaching. So the first one is storytelling. Now, storytelling is a very powerful tool uh, that can be used in almost any subject and allows you the flexibility of uh, tools. So I, I was teaching consumer behavior then the topic that I needed to, 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 to teach was uh, consumer choice heuristics. So they had to analyze or understand, uh, you know, the rules we make in our minds when we decide to buy something. So the target skill uh, competency is uh, being able to communicate and critical thinking. So it's a storytelling exercise. So basically, uh, in the classroom, I, of course, introduced the concept of consumer choice heuristics. Uh, and then I discussed the activity that they needed to do. No? So they had to go out, observe a friend or a family member, uh, and then create a story to outline the steps they took in, making, in buying a product and the factors they considered in making the decision. So either they were observing carefully or maybe asking questions, but trying not to uh, reveal that they are intensely studying uh, the person's uh, uh, buying behavior. So I allowed them the flexibility to use whatever tool they wanted to tell their story. So one is Storybird, others can choose PowerPoint or any app if they didn't have any internet connection. So one student didn't have internet connection, so, but he, she had access to a computer with PowerPoint. So she took a picture of a family member and told her story in that manner. No? So this is an example and then just submitted it in the LMS. Another is a discussion. Of course, discussion will play a very important role in how we facilitate learning for reflection, interaction, and um, being able to communicate. So again, for consumer behavior, so it's ethics in advertising. The objective was for them to practice critical thinking and cultural civic consciousness. Uh, distinguish between an ethical ad and an unethical ad. So show and tell, no? so via discussion forum. So they have to search advertisements locally and international, internationally, uh, ads that show women in a 
positive light and women in a negative light. And then they should also react to the posts of their classmates. So activities like this, you cannot just say you, you have to do it in one day because you need to provide time for the students to uh, view the work of their classmates and interact with each other. So I think for this one, I gave about one or two weeks for them to really dive deeper. So this is uh, a screenshot of uh, samples that they have been sharing. Uh, what I like about this is uh, some start to express concern. A lot of them uh, re expressed that they didn't realize that their uh, advertising is like so insidious in terms of uh, so subtle in the messaging and some felt angry, some realized that uh, sometimes their self-concept is really influenced by the advertisements that they see. So we were able to get a lot of opportunities for them to reflect also on how uh, advertising influences their self-concept. So it's hard to do that if you don't give them enough time to really uh, do deeper, deeper reflection. And then finally, online portfolio. So in this case, uh, this is more of like an, uh, a major requirement where they have to uh, show their ability to uh, promote a brand online, starting with themselves, right? So how did they build their personal brand online? How do they present themselves as aspiring marketing professionals? So I asked them to create a portfolio uh, in, about, in a website called About Me but also integrating all of the social media tools that they uh, will be using when they move to the corporate world, right? So these are some examples of my students who, uh, uh, as a way to show, it's more of like a portfolio, as a way for them to show their capability, not just in using the tools, but effectively using is this to promote or build, uh, starting with their personal brands and then eventually with the brands that they will be representing when they start working. So, of course, when we think about this, teachers, as teachers, how do we, we try to realize how much time do I have to be able to do this? I need to learn so many things. How can I prepare? Even if we have uh, internet uh, tools, so IT tools, we have software to be able to do it. But uh, is it really possible to provide differentiated learning or personalized learning? Uh, yes, it is because we have, as long as we have some enablers, one is uh, systems that have automation. No? So there are now learning management systems that have automated actions. So like when we add rules, no, when we provide feedback, uh, it feels as if the, to the student as if we're giving the feedback, but the, the system will be able to do it for us. So a lot of the repetitive things that we do as teachers are reduced, if not eliminated. And then providing students with their own uh, accounts or access to better able, enable them to track the progress of their learners, uh, be informed about uh, the things that they need to do or uh, the requirements, and then, of course, personalizing learning. So I'll share some examples that we have in our own LMS. So when we design learning activities or learning experience, once we have made that map, we plot it into modules, right, modules. So it is here, uh, we have our canvas. So let's say, for example, uh, you, you add a page where you put in all, your, all of your content or even content that you found on the internet. And then you, uh, a next uh, section, an, another part of the, the module that you're creating, you have either a quiz, different kinds of activities. So when the student, when this is uh, shown to the student, they will feel that, this is the learning journey that I will take for a particular topic or for the entire course. So from the view of the teacher, this is what it looks like when you're planning a learning experience. So you divide the topics into uh, modules no? and then be able to plan uh, what elements you're going to use for each module. And then notice that besides sections, you can also uh, tag lessons with competencies. So what are or what we call learning outcomes and then do completion when what happens when a student completes the, the module and then even personalize. So when you talk about personalization, depending on how the student performs, you can make a module or an assessment visible 
only to a specific type of learner. Let's say <coughs> after taking a pretest in the introduction part, the student scores very high in your pretest which is uh, evidence that they can move faster along the course because they have um, shown that they have learned all the, the initial modules. So somebody can move faster, but somebody, let's say, for example, needs to have a refresher course first or access to additional modules that can be personalized. No? How do you do that? So we have automation features in our LMS to guide activities. No? So this is something that the teacher can do uh, when, uh, depending on how the students behave in the, uh, the platform, uh, a, a, a lesson can be locked, uh, a lesson can be hidden or uh, shown to the learner depending on uh, how they progress. So this allows for personalized uh, teaching and learning without really having to burden the, the teacher too much in terms of implementing it. Of course, we need to invest time uh, designing the courses in the beginning, we can do that as teams. We can do it uh, and collaborate and share copies of the courses to make it easier for us. Now, we need to also collaborate with parents as co-teachers. So I hope that whatever tool that we are using <coughs> allows for the creation of accounts of parents, especially for basic ed, uh, for them to have their own account. So this is a screenshot of a parent account and then um, they're able to see <clears throat> their children in the platform and also be able to view, no? just view, depending on what the school will allow, view their um, lessons and see what instructions the teacher gave. So on the side, they will be also be able to see the scores of their learners and even uh, be shown no, how, the stud how their children are earning mastery or earning the achieving the learning outcomes intended for a course. That is also be a, a outside of grades. No? They will be able to see the grades depending on how the school decides, what kind of information the school decides to present to, to the parents. So finally, uh, I think as we move to this, it's important that we think about uh, the concept of growth mindset. No? The, the idea of having a fixed or a growth mindset was based on the research of uh, Stanford psychologist Carl Dweck. So uh, this is very important for us teachers. No? When we think about uh, having a fixed mindset, it means that when we fail, uh, a failure is a sign of the limit of our abilities. No? Remember, I remember when I was, uh, I, I had a very, I failed in math when I was in elementary and I somehow thought that I will always be bad at math. So I would be so stressed every time uh, when I had, uh, of course, college subject in math. So I always felt that I was, not good in math. So that's a kind of a fixed mindset thing. But when you have a growth mindset, you think that failure is an opportunity to grow, that you can learn anything as long as you put effort into it. You know? And feedback is something that will help you grow as a person. So this is something that we need to reflect on individually. But as teachers, it's more also very important in how it shapes the mind of our learners. Because if a teacher has a fixed mindset, Let's say you know from uh, a grade five, uh, a grade four student who will now be your student as a grade five teacher is a very problematic kid. No? So you have that preconception already. And then when you have a fixed mindset, you believe that this student will not change. You will already re react to that student differently and then will not give the student any opportunity to change. No? But if you have the growth mindset as a teacher, you will approach students differently in the sense that you provide uh, a growth mindset, no? drives motivation and achievement. When we let students believe that they can get smarter by focusing on learning as the goal, uh, they put in more effort and spend more time working hard, they can achieve more. But the challenge for us teachers is how do we provide more opportunities for them to learn, to improve, uh, instead of just moving them along a given timeline. So this is where technology plays a very crucial role because if you have uh, features like automation, features that are flexible enough to allow you to provide opportunities to different students without really uh, consuming a lot of time, uh, it's, it's a good way for us. No? It doesn't mean that we have to do everything manually or step by step. So uh, that's an important thing. But 
uh, it's very important that when we give feedback to the students, we try to show that we will support them if they want to learn more or if they want to achieve a particular skill by providing them with more opportunities. So I hope, uh, do, you, do you agree with the growth mindset? Do you think it's important? So if you do, uh, then I ask you to commit to it. Uh, before we end, I ask you to recite the growth mindset with me. So let's take the growth mindset pledge. The growth mindset classroom pledge every day I will try my best. I will not quit. I will not rest until my brain has grown a bit and I have learned how to do it. If I fail, I will be okay. I will just try a different way. I will say I just can't do it yet because I have a growth mindset. So I also encourage you to share this with your students and maybe try as a practice to recite it uh, regularly in your class. So finally, we have a free version of our Neo LMS for teachers with 400 students or less. So you can create a free trial by going to neolms.com. And please feel free to reach out uh, if you need help or if you have any questions. Thanks to Aviva, Aviva Publishing for inviting me to share um, uh, this with you. Uh, I hope uh, we all stay healthy and well. So God bless everyone. Thank you.